Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning, this Friday morning. It's the 5th of May and um, we're going to be um, we're on the EDGE talks this morning. We're going to be talking about Feel to Think, the power of empathy in film to change behaviour and systems. And this, this session is going to be led by Chris Godwin. Um, yeah, so joining in today and beyond. Now, if you, we would really like this to be as participative and engaging as possible. We know it's going to be an exciting, a, a very exciting session. Um, so if you are joining, why not um, join us in the chat room, you know, tell us what you're thinking and what you're feeling, how the session is resonating with you, and even ask questions to the presenter, that'd be perfectly fine. Um, and please um, tweet using the hashtag hash edge talk and the Twitter handle at a school for change and at Horizons NHS. So let's keep all the activity going, let's get our voices heard and also let's try and bring in other people who haven't joined the session today. So my name is Janet Wildman, I'm a part-time associate with Horizons, I'll be the chair this morning. Um, we're also joined by Lee Kendall, she's going to be doing the Twitter monitor this morning. And in the um, chat room um, and helping us with all any um, technical difficulties is Lewis Warner. So you've got a great team working with you today supporting the session. So without any further ado, I want to introduce you to Chris Godwin. He's the director of Inner Eye Productions and he comes from a journalist background. His interest is in how we can use film to understand behavioural change and NHS systems, as well as tackle below the surface and hard to reach issues that are limiting the performance of organisations, teams and leaders. He has worked with Guys and St Thomas um, NHS Foundation and he's produced uh, a really interesting film, Barbara's Story, which is a series of change dramas around dementia. Um, you can contact him at Inner Eye Prod and um, I'm just looking forward to hearing more about his exciting work and learning from this session. So over to you, Chris. Great, uh, thanks very much, Janet. Uh, and uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so basically, um, as Janet said, so I'm the creative director and the um, and the owner of um, Inner Eye Productions. Um, I was formerly the creative director of White Boat Television, um, and the films that you're going to see today are the films that I made with um, with White Boat Television. I've just literally just set up um, my production company, Inner Eye Productions, to specialise in, in in this work in behaviour change dramas. Um, now Janet gave, me, gave you a sort of brief uh, introduction to me and my background, um, um, but it's just to kind of give you a bit more detail. Um, yes, so my background is in journalism. I then went to work for the BBC. I worked for the BBC for 11 years, uh, mainly working as a producer director in factual programmes. Um, uh, from there I then um, uh, worked uh, mainly in the advertising and the corporate film sector. Um, and it's while working in the corporate film sector that um, I've sort of acquired this specialism in behaviour change dramas in the health sector. Um, and um, the, um, the first, the, the, and the, the, what sort of started me on this journey was uh, a film called Barbara's Story, which was uh, sort of mentioned in the, in the introduction there. And um, this is a film that was commissioned by um, guys in St. Thomas's Hospital. And what they were looking to do is they were looking to change behaviour and attitudes to um, dementia patients but also elderly patients within the trust. Um, and they had a very clear brief, they wanted to really make a big impact uh, through the use of film. Uh, they wanted to have people to go on an emotional journey with the film and to really enable them to reflect on their own practice. Um, and the other thing that they were very clear about within the brief was that it, what they wanted it to be a drama, um, which was an interesting um, and bold um, part of the brief. Uh, as I think, you know, it's more expensive, generally drama, and um, I think um, most people would would um, automatically go for doing a documentary-based film. So we worked very closely with um, the dementia team at Guys and St. Thomas's to basically create a character, but also to create a storyline as well. And the character that we created was um, was um, uh, Barbara Reese, 
Um, her backstory was that she was um, an ex-head teacher. She was in her early 80s and she had undiagnosed dementia. Uh, the story is very simple. Um, she's going to for a cardiology appointment. And we depict that for uh, somebody who has um, dementia, uh, a, a journey to hospital is, can be very traumatic, can be very upset, upsetting, can be very distressing. And within the film and within the encounters that she um, has in the film, she experiences good and bad practice, but mostly bad practice uh, with one sort of notable exception. Um, and um, the film, the way the film was used was um, that it was made compulsory for all 12,000 staff at the Eisen St. Thomas's to watch it. So straight from your HR through to porters, through to your consultants, everyone had to watch this film. And the forum in, the, uh, in which the film was going to be watched was um, in the lecture theatres at Guys and St. Thomas's. Um, and so you had sort of around sort of 300 people attending these sessions to, to watch the film. So it was quite a commitment um, for the trust to get all those people together and inspired um, to do this um, and to be part of this, um, um, the film and the behaviour change that the film was hoping to elicit. The, the, the way that it worked was the film was shown to in these sessions and then afterwards um, uh, it was opened up for debate and discussion and reflections on on the film and you know what people felt as a result of watching the of, of watching the film um, and it and it and it made a massive difference um, you know research by South Bank University demonstrated that there was a significant cultural shift in the hospital. There was um, a move to more compassionate care of patients, uh, dementia patients and elderly patients. Um, and, um, and, and ultimately there was, um, Barbara became the byword for good behavior, not good behavior, but compassionate care and, and, and doing the good and the right thing. Um, so it was, you know, a really big success. We kind of met the brief, we excelled the brief in terms of, of, of trying to change behavior. And what I want to do now is um, I want to show you a film um, that we did. It was this is this is a um, an interview with with Eileen Sills talking about the film and talking about the impact that it had. So I'm going to hand over to Lewis, who's who's now going to just play the film for me. We wanted to create something that nobody would ever forget. We wanted to create something where people felt the need to have tissues and, and it very emotional whilst they watched it. Um, we didn't want to deliberately make people cry.
So, um, so that there's a line at the end there which says the Bible story will continue, and that sort of um, sort of uh, sort of gives you sorry, kind of kind of ages that film because what happened after um, we made the film, we were then commissioned to make a further five films, which followed Barbara as she descended for a deeper into the dementia, and ultimately um, she dies at the end of, uh, in, the, in episode six. Um, and we sort of touched lots of different issues in terms of her patient pathway along the way. Um, so so you, I think you've got a sense of, you know, the impact that it had um, uh, very, very soon after the, 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 the project um, uh, was completed in the trust. But I think what's really, really interesting um, about this project, and um, one thing that we never, never expected was that actually the film uh, and the series of films that followed it would lead to tangible changes within the trust. So as a company, we'd have met the brief, we'd, we'd made a film that had you know, reached out to hearts and minds and it had made people think differently about how they interact with patients with dementia and elderly patients as well. But what we hadn't anticipated was that there would be other things that, that went on, which weren't to do with frontline staff, were actually to do with management and leadership. So the first thing that happened, and, and it was mentioned by Eileen in that clip there, was that the porters started, as a result of the film, they started trying to push their wheelchairs forward as opposed to pulling them back. And this was as a result of a scene in the film where Barbara was being pulled in the corridor along with uh, in a wheelchair being pulled backwards and we just we depict how disorientating upsetting and distressing that can be for a dementia patient to be pulled backwards and so the porters took it upon themselves to start trying to push the patients forward rather than pulling them backwards the problem being that the wheelchairs are not designed to be pushed forward they're designed to be pulled backwards and this led to Eileen and her team to start reflecting on, well, why have we got wheelchairs that only pull backwards? Maybe we should have wheelchairs that pull, push forwards. And so as a result of, of that, um, Eileen got rid of the wheelchairs that pull backwards and, and, and now have wheelchairs that push forwards instead. Um, and so that's a very, that's a classic example there of bottom-up change. Staff feeling moved by the, story of Barbara to really want to make a difference for their patients and in, in a way and, and then in, in doing so putting pressure on the leadership and management to do something different and that was that could only be achieved by really uh, walking in the shoes of the patient walking in the shoes of the dementia patient and understanding their experience through the power of empathy and also through the power of film as well the other thing that happened as well was that, um, sorry Lewis, we'll just go back one from there. So we'll just slip through one, yeah. The other thing um, that happened was that the reception areas were reconfigured. Um, and this was a result of the scene, and, and there's, there's a short bit of the scene in, in that film that I just showed you, where um, Barbara is shown to be very upset that she's trying to interact with the receptionist, but the receptionist gets distracted by the phone. She feels ignored at a time when she needs compassion, at a time where she needs warmth. She's confused, she's distressed, and she's reaching out, and she doesn't get anything back from the receptionist because they're distracted by the phone. So, so, this, so basically, Eileen and her team decide, well, well, why don't we start trying to reconfigure our reception areas so that we have a receptionist who's dedicated to the patient and we have somebody who's dedicated to the phone. So there isn't the issue where um, there's there's a distraction going on there. So 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 she's moved towards uh, reconfiguring some of the reception areas from Guys and St Thomas's. The other significant significant thing that happened uh, was nothing to do with the actual final products of the film or watch the film. It was actually to do with the process of making the film in, in itself. Um, in one of the later episodes of Barbara's story, we depict a nurse sitting on a bed and holding Barbara's hand. And in the edit, it was um, uh, some of the, the, the nurses from Guys and St. Thomas's were saying, we can't have that because that's against infection control. Um, and then a discussion sort of, um, sort of broke out um, from that. And the discussion was around, well, what is the best thing for that person at that particular time? Is, is it infection control or is it compassion? Um, and actually, it's 
it, it was decided that compassion is probably the best thing. So that scene was kept in through the final edit. Um, and and that, that's a kind of a really interesting sort of process and thing that we weren't really expecting that, 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 um, that, that as a result, the scene was kept in and infection control policy has now un was now under review in, in guys in St. Thomas's um, to kind of, you know, think differently about it. And, and that's really, um, um, uh, if, uh, Lewis, actually, could you go on to the next? Yeah. So what, what, what we've got there is this, this comes back to the title of this talk, the, the ability to, the feel to think. So by walking in the shoes of Barbara, by walking in the shoes of, um, of a patient, we're able to, to offer an emotional connection to a patient and to the patient pathway in a, in a way that you could never achieve through charts, graphs, spreadsheets, that would never achieve that um, because you don't, it doesn't have the ability to really understand. You can see it on the, on the piece of paper, but actually what is actually the impact on that individual? What, what does it really feel like to be that patient? So by using film, by using empathy, you suddenly create this emotional connection with the individual um, and so that you can start thinking differently about things. You can start thinking differently about, about the process and about the impact of, of the process and the systems that you're using on that particular patient. So effectively what, what, what I'm saying is that the film, by feeling and getting a feeling and an emotion from the film, it's giving context to your thinking in a way that you can't get through dry um, data and spreadsheets, et cetera. There's obviously a place for that, but there's, there's also a place for getting that emotional connection there as well. So if we kind of talk generally about empathy, I mean, there's a lot talked about empathy at the moment. It seems to be part of the zeitgeist at the moment in, in, in the health sector as well. Um, you know, Barbara's story in itself has demonstrated the power of empathy in action. Um, and, you know, we're moving to a, to a point where technology is going to take over diag diagnosis. I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure that's not, you know, not that far away. And so in terms of, you know, clinicians are, need, are probably going to be thinking that their roles are slightly different. So it's not, it is about the diagnosis, but, but it's going to be more about what is the treatment and how do you help that person with that diagnosis? And there's evidence to suggest that in, that, the, that when clinicians and health workers, when they um, are more empathetic and are more empathetic with their, their patients, it leads to better health outcomes. They get better quicker. Um, and evidence also shows that doctors and nurses who are empathetic tend to provide better care. Um, so we need to find a way of channeling this empathy, and that's where the power of film comes into play. That we can sort of channel it in that way. And the, and the last thing on this point I'd like to make is that this, these are not training films. We're not kind of showing people what to do. We're basically just using the power of storytelling to really enable people to reflect on their own lives, reflect on their own practice, and think differently about others. Um, training films have, uh, the danger with training films is that when they start showing you, they start trying to teach you things, it takes you out the moment. It takes you out of the emotional connection. They like um, bad product placement in films. When you when you see bad product placement, you'll suddenly feel that you're being sold to rather than being emotionally engaged um, in the film. Um, so, Lewis, if we could move on to the next one. So, what I want to show you now is this is um, um, a, a, a scene from Barbara's story, which was um, in in the final episode. And I'll, sh I'll I'll show you the clip, and then afterwards I'll explain I'll explain it, but. It, the reason why I want to share it, it really is a very good example of this first person perspective and really understanding what it's like to be that patient in this particular place to be a case to be a patient with dementia who's in hospital for delirium because of a bad chest infection and who is distressed, confused and very, very upset.
so 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 just to kind of talk you through that scene so first of all she thinks that um barbara thinks that she's in hospital because she's having a baby so the implication is that you know she's um thinking you know she's regressed to uh, uh her being in her late 20s early 30s um and we you know we understand that by the use of the baby sounds and um and uh, and then it becomes a lot clearer when we see her walking down the corridor and she sees her husband at the end of the corridor as a young man um so we suddenly feel the tragedy of her tragic situation that she's in and how heartbreaking it is that um you know she's living as if she was still a young woman um and is completely confused and upset by what she's seeing but if you dissect that scene even more um there's some real learnings that you can get from it so why is barbara uh, seeing her husband at the end of the corridor and it's because the doctor at the end of the corridor has got glasses just like her husband used to wear glasses and that triggers the, the connection there um so there's 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 sort of subtle things that you probably wouldn't pick up on first viewing but when you dissect that in the research around it then those things start to become to become clear um so hopefully that sort of gives you a really good idea of how you can use this first person perspective in a really powerful emotional way but also with some really underlying learnings there and understanding of what it is to be that patient so the next thing I want to talk to you about is research. The, the most important part of making these films, without without a doubt, is the research. The research um, um, it, it is so key because it's about really finding out and getting under the skin of what is the patient's experience, what are they really really thinking, what what are the what is the commonality here between the patient's experience. So I will speak to as many patients and clinicians as possible. Uh, when I'm tackling these films. And I want to talk to you about a film that I did after Barbara's story called The Deafening Silence. Um, and uh, this is a, um, a film that um, uh, is very harrowing. Um, it's a film about the experience of a mother going through a stillbirth. And um, the film itself was based on lots of interviews that I did with, with lots of different um, mothers who've gone through this experience and the commonality of experience, the thing that kept coming back uh, from their experience was this sense of guilt that in some way they were responsible for for the death of their child. And um, and that became the central narrative to the film. Um, and um, and I'm going to show you a clip now and it is quite harrowing and, and, and I would understand if you don't want to watch um, this uh, particular clip. It's only uh, two minutes what, two minutes long, um, but um, it it uh, it will give you an idea of um, the power of 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 this first person perspective and the insight that we got through the research that we did.
Um, so I don't know whether I made that clear. That was actually a trailer. So that's not the whole film. The whole film was um, actually um, 20 minutes in duration. Um, and Lewis, are we on to another slide or uh, one after that? Ah, here we go. Oh, yeah. So before we go into that one, um, what, what I'd like to do is I'm going to show you now. Um, I mean, there, there, there was lots of research done, which I'll kind of go on to. But um, let me quickly just go and show you straight away an interview that was done with um, the Royal College of Midwives about the impact of the film um, on, on midwives and, um, and, and how it's impacted their, their work on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, yeah, so if we could just play this film. You've been placed on hold. Please wait. Racing with So, uh, the, you know, uh, sort of, I hope that gave you some insight into the power and the impact that it's had on on, on midwives. Um, I mean, there was, there was some actually research that was done 
um, quite significant research that was done uh, on the impact of it um, three months after it was shown in, in different hospitals. Uh, and it showed um, some quite significant changes in, in practice. Um, and if we can move on to the next slide, Lewis, from there. Um, but what it also did is once again, you know, we had this, we had this, there was the evaluation which was demonstrating that behavior change had happened as a result of the film. But what was really interesting is that once again, we had this system change, this kind of insight that the film had enabled, um, uh, had provided, uh, the insights had provided, uh, sorry, let me start that again. What the film had done is effectively given an emotional connection um, to the processes and systems that were in place. And so lots of hospitals started talking about how they were changing their systems. And so we've got a quote here saying, as a direct result of the training, we're now involving more of our student midwives in bereavement care to introduce them to the issues earlier and enhance their practice. So there you've got a bit of a process that has changed, bringing a student midwives earlier into um, the, the into bereavement care, something that wasn't happening before. And then the next one, um, all our paperwork has been refreshed, reorganized, and made readily available. What's interesting about that is that actually the film doesn't uh, doesn't really look at um, uh, paperwork and how paperwork can go missing and, and how it can be distressing to patients. But by watching the film, having an emotional connection, it almost recalibrates everything and you start thinking, well, how can I improve practice? What can I do differently? And this is an example of that. So we're just simply reorganizing the paperwork. Um, so there's another example of feeling to think, giving an, giving an emotional context and giving to enable you to think differently from a different perspective about how the systems and the processes work to change and to impact on the patients. Um, but what was also really interesting about this film is that there was the empathy was not the impact of the empathy wasn't literally on management and also on um, on, on uh, frontline staff. It, there was actually empathy for patients as well, which seems quite odd, knowing that if you watch the film and how distressing it is. Um, but the film went, was put on YouTube to date. It's only had it's had three hundred thousand um, views. It's had four hundred comments. If you read those comments, it's from families uh, and, and parents who've experienced um, a stillbirth, talking about their experiences and, and saying it, thank you for doing, making this film, it's given us a reason to talk about it. So it kind of broke the silence around stillbirth of these people and it enabled them to, to, um, to share it with family members who might not understand what they've been through. Um, and just by watching the film, it was I'm not alone. This is this is happening to other people. I'm feeling the same things. So that was an unexpected um, uh, outcome. I mean, the other element to this film as well is that they got a lot of publicity in the media. We were on uh, national TV, a number of national networks, um, and in the, in the papers as well. And 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 so it started raising awareness of the issue around stillbirth in general. You know why? Why do we have such bad um, record in, um, in in stillbirths in this country? So it, it it had a lot of impacts way beyond the initial brief. Uh, Lewis, can we go on to the next slide? So I'm just going to. So there's a couple more films I want to take you through. This one is called Seen and Heard. This was a film that was commissioned by the Department of Health at the beginning of last year to raise awareness of um, child sexual abuse. Um, to, to, to health, health workers, healthcare workers, to basically give them the confidence and the courage to elicit a disclosure of child abuse if they felt that a child was being abused. Um, and this is probably the most ambitious thing I've ever done. It was um, the aim is to reach 750,000 people across the NHS, um, and and the website as well, the online training package that went with it is really slick and really, really well thought through and it works brilliantly with the film, uh, which takes you through the story of a young boy who's being abused by his older stepbrother. And it works on a number of levels. The story, you, 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 you're taken through the learning from that first person perspective through three different chapters of the film. And then ultimately um, you, you watch the final chapter. So there's a sense of wanting to stick around to, to complete the e-learning because you want to find out what happens in the end. So I'm now going to show you um, a trailer for this film um, and there's, there's something else I want to talk to you about it afterwards. So um, yeah, if we just play this 
this trailer. So what was um, interesting about um, the film I've just showed you, which is actually a trailer in itself, um, is that um, the, the, the trailer became an impact film. Um, it, so you've got, the, you've got the, the full film, which was about 18 to 20 minutes, I can't remember now. And then you've got the trailer, which is, as you've just seen, it's two minutes long. And that works really well on social media. It really, uh, it's really something that you can share quite easily in social media. and and direct people to the training, but also just generally raise awareness about child sexual abuse. Um, and so, and that's, so that's how, so the, that's how we, we now do it. We kind of, we will make the film, but we'll also make a trailer that will go alongside it, that, that can have a different life and can have a different purpose. Um, the, the, just there's some, just some sort of statistics on the impacts of, of, of um, seen and heard. Um, so far, the research um, and the evaluation has demonstrated um, some really, really positive results in raising awareness of child sexual, um, uh, child sexual abuse in this country. So, um, yeah, once again, walking in the shoes of Tyler, a child who's being abused, um, kind of really brings it home, uh, the, the, the pain of uh, child sexual abuse and um, and you know what, what health what, what we can do within the health sector to make a difference for 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 those children. Um, so if we move on to the next one, yeah. Um, so this is um this is a film um, called Teenage Misadventure. This is a film that's only just literally just been launched, um, and it's about self harm. It was done for the East London NHS Foundation Trust, and. What they're wanting to do is to make a film that ultimately destigmatizes self-harm. Um, lots of children and young people are turning up in A&E &E, um, uh, &E's across the country, and um, they are made to feel perhaps not as good as they perhaps should do, turning up at an A&E, considering they're probably there for some underlying emotional distress. Um, and and so this film was about sort of well what is self harm why are children and young people uh, self harming and and not to stigmatise um, children and young people self harming as something that is sort of in some ways self inflicted and um, perhaps don't deserve the same sort of sympathy as somebody else who's in A and E for another condition um, and so you know once again we spoke to lots of young people we spoke to clinicians. Um, and we came up with a sort of quite hard-hitting drama um, about the experiences of a boy called Dan, um, 
and his experiences of going to hospital and how emotionally distressing it can be um, and 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 also understanding where that emotional distress comes from and in his particular case it came from domestic abuse at home and this was actually based on you know real testimony from from um, one of the clinicians that I spoke to um, it, that that was the kind of the light bulb moment in terms of the story that we were going to create um, so if I'll just show you the, the trailer to this one So what was interesting about this film is, I mean, first of all, we haven't done a full evaluation on it yet because it hasn't, it's only literally just been launched, but we, we had a screening of it uh, for the launch of the film and um, it was attended by senior people within um, um, East London NHS Foundation Trust. And, and what was quite interesting is um, a discussion sort of broke out uh, during the, the launch about, well, why, why is it when children and young people go to A&E um, because they're self-harmed, why is it that they have to tell their story to so many different people, from the receptionist, through to the triage nurse, through to the nurse, through to the doctor, and ultimately through to the psych liaison nurse? What, is that the best thing for them? For somebody who is emotionally distressed, is that the best that we can do for them? Or perhaps should we be treating children who come in uh, who are self-harming slightly differently? Um, and so who knows what, what that discussion will lead to, but there was just an, once again, it was just feel to think this creating an emotional connection, making you think differently about the process, making you think differently about how you treat um, and, um, and, and care for people who are emotionally distressed because of self-harm. Um, so yeah, getting, giving context to thinking again. Um, okay, so the last one, the film I want to show, this has literally just been launched. Uh, this is a film called Beyond Baby Blue. It was commissioned by the charity Best Beginnings. Um, and it was actually launched um, as part of the Heads Together campaign uh, by the Duchess of Cambridge, along with lots of other uh, short documentary films um, at, the, uh, um, at the Royal College of Obstetricians. It was, it was part of a, a broader uh, initiative called Out of the Blue. Um, and... Um, and once again, this is a film. This, sorry, this is a film about postnatal depression. And once again, it was researched through lots of interviews with different women um, and men who had gone through postnatal depression. And uh, and when I was speaking to these people, 
uh, there was a real sense that the the commonality of experience tragically was that most of the women I spoke to, in fact, I think all the women I spoke to had considered killing their own child, and all of them had actually considered suicide as well. So it was quite staggering that when I was speaking to these women who, who had suffered from, from postnatal depression, and we decided to, to, to feature this. So it, it's harrowing, it's very hard hitting, it's distressing, um, but it was, we wanted it to be true to the experience of women who are suffering postnatal depression. We didn't want to shy away from that. And we wanted it to really hit home. And, you know, one of the initial, one of the reasons behind this initiative is to hopefully lead to a, a policy change as well around postnatal depression. So, um, uh, so yeah, what will I show you the, the trailer to the film? So um, yeah, so it was yeah a har harrowing film, and um, um, but hopefully it's going to have big impact um, and really start to change things for um, uh, for for women who are suffering from postnatal depression and and also men. I mean, we're actually looking for funding to get a film about the male perspective on postnatal depression as well, uh, which is something which is really needed. Um, so Lewis, if we go on to the final slide, so. So yeah, so just to kind of um, to wrap up and to kind of conclude, I think you know we talk about patient-centered care, and you know the way to really, I suppose, to really live out patient-centered care is really use the power of empathy um, and use it in a way that can really make a big difference. And I hopefully I've demonstrated you for you today not only the power of empathy but also the power of film to use empathy in a really productive. Um, way both both in terms of behavior change but also system and process change as well yes we need charts we need graphs we need spreadsheets we need all those things but we also can't forget about the emotional connection and we can't forget what that gives you in, in terms of the context you're thinking um, as I said they're not training films they're behavior change dramas and they're designed to show you how to do things Sorry, they're designed to enable you to reflect differently on your own lives and your own practice and hopefully think differently about others. And that's essentially um, the kind of message and that I want my work to do, my films to do, um, is, to, is to really make people think differently and, um, and, and, and resolve to, to make a difference and, 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 and change. So that's me. I've done this and I'd be happy to you know, answer any questions or um, hear any thoughts um, from uh, from everyone today. Hi, Chris. That was so powerful. Um, there's been so much um, discussion in the chat room. Um, um, I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Lee to find out what's happening in Twitter, what's the conversation like there. 
how is this um, resounding with our wider, wider audience? So over to you, Lee, first. Are you there, Lee? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, uh, and thanks so much for a, a really compelling um, talk there, Chris. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, people on Twitter have been um, retweeting and sharing their thoughts. Um, I think people have been very much um, really glued to um, all of the trailers and everything that have been saying. So, you know, um, and there's a lot of food for thought there for people um, to really um, you know, understand how the films have. Uh, made such a, a huge impact on the audiences and you know it's only really just starting I think so yeah thank you very much. Thanks very much there um, Lee and over to um, Lewis on the chat room is there anything that you'd like to feed back on that? Hi everyone um, yeah for, I mean first of all for me absolutely amazing um, obviously working with Chris to set this up um, I got a glimpse of what was coming but it doesn't that still doesn't really prepare you for what you're see on screen. Um, within the chat room, uh, people have been saying about how uh, deafening silence portrays uh, that feeling of guilt. Um, and Deanna Mason said about the pen, uh, pen it's penetrating to see the reality of um, the dementia film. And then about how videos like this are a catalyst for change um, within how care. And then I think What's been echoed throughout the um, chat is that this should be mandatory training. Everyone should see this. Um, that we are privileged to be seeing this today, but that it should be seen by everybody in their healthcare because of the impact it's had. Um, and then a good point raised as well um, about how Kingston Hospital have a free text uh, section where you can text in uh, about about maternity. Um, so you're learning as well as uh, discussing here. So yeah. Thank you so much there, Lewis. Um, over to you, Chris, any, any responses to some of those um, comments? Um, well, it's great that we're, we're, we're talking about um, stuff already. I mean, you know, they, they mentioned about Kingston Hospital. I mean, that's great that that's sort of, you know, we're, we, you know, it's, it's getting us to, to share about those things as well. I think the, that, that particular film, uh, Deafening Silence, was, um, was really a hard one to film and um you know i think if you see the film you can go on to youtube to actually watch it um um the, there's the, the the lead actress um puts a performance which you can only think that she was really try, really kind of living it and really um um really kind of understood and and well, as much as she could do that the experience of of women who've gone through this and um, you know, certainly on set, there was a real, a real power to to her performance and and to the film itself. Um, and and I think you know, and that to be honest with you, that happens quite a lot. It quite happens quite a lot that on set where you feel very moved yourself, and it's not a sort of dry process. You're you're very struck, and I think that um, is testimony to the authenticity of. The films in that they are rooted in real life experience um, and um, you know and hopefully you know they, they will make a difference I think there's an interesting point about making them compulsory um, and I think that is absolutely the best way to do it and what was quite interesting about the experience at guys in St Thomas's with the dementia project is there was a lot of cynicism about it initially uh, I think, you know, because it was being made compulsory to everyone, even if you didn't really deal with the metro patients. And um, and the, and what, what they soon discovered was that actually people changed their views on it and embraced it in a really, really powerful way. So so whilst you, you, you were made to attend, um, initially the sessions uh, were quite, quite were, well, they were, they were quite well attended, but, but, but within three weeks, you had um, there was people being turned away because word had got around that um, you know that you need to see this, you need to watch this film, um, and so so by making it compulsory, I think is a really really key thing, um, uh, and you know that may uh, that may be one incentive making it compulsory to watch it, but I suppose the other incentive could also be um, you know be part of the CPD training. Um, 
and, um, and other elements to, to make people sort of engage with it. Thanks for that, that um, Chris. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to mention quite quickly um, is that you do make the, dis the, the, the important differentiation between um, a teaching film and, and your films. Could you just take us through what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of, they are very, very different. I mean, what's quite interesting with the dementia film was um, when we were doing the research for it and we were working with guys in St. Thomas's quite closely, um, we, we were asked if we could do a sliding doors um, mechanic in the film, i.e. let's show bad practice and then let's show exactly the same scene but as good practice. And we really fought against that because that for us was training. That's a training film and, and by doing it that way, you're, you almost kind of strip out the emotion, the emotion of it because it takes you out of that moment and it's saying, this is what you need to learn here. And if at any point you're watching these films and you're thinking, oh, I should be learning something, then it's not achieving what it's supposed to do. That learning has got to come through reflection. And if it comes through reflection, it's going to be far deeper and longer lasting than somebody saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. I think we've all seen powerful films and we were reflected on them, um, you know, for days afterwards. And that's what these films have got to do. They've got to be that powerful. They've got to have that much of an emotional connection that the learning um, stays there deep down for a, long, for a lot longer than they would do if it was a training film. Chris, I want to say thank you on behalf of everybody who's joined us on, in the chat room on Twitter um, and the Horizons group. We really enjoyed that session. That was just really thought-provoking. It's just taken us to another place in terms of addressing some really difficult, challenging issues. So a big thank you to you. I want to say um, to everybody who's joined us, have a great weekend. Um, look forward to the next session of Edge Talks on the 2nd of June. And so um, have a great weekend and see you then. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Bye.